And before you know it, when we look at all these trucks coming at us, all these problems converging towards us, we have this sense that there's actually nowhere we can go, that we are risking overload, that our coping capacity simply isn't up to the challenges we face. Turns out this is actually a very valuable way of thinking about the state of our world. If you go back and look at the great instances of social instability in the past, the great revolutions such as the French Revolution in the 18th century, the Russian Revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, more recently the Iranian Revolution in 1979, in each one of those cases the societies fell apart because they were being hit by multiple shocks simultaneously. They couldn't cope. And for individuals in a situation like this, standing in that parking lot, your response might be quite reasonably to just roll up in a little ball on the asphalt and close your eyes and cover your ears and hope it all goes away. But if we do that, then we really are going to end up in a real mess. We have to think through the problem and try to understand what's going on. But this, this problem of convergence is really critical because we've got all these things going on at the same time and yet our policy makers and our leaders and even each one of us as individuals tends to look at these problems individually and not realize that they're actually interacting with each other, that's why the multiplication signs are there, that they reinforce each other and that we actually have to deal with them all at the same time. And that's what really is the biggest challenge of all. In fact, I'd say this coming century is going to be the time of the greatest challenge for the human species in its history. So I'll talk a little bit about each one of these three. I'm going to spend a bit more time on economic instability because it's on everybody's mind right now. What is the cause of this crisis? Where did it come from? And then I'll talk a bit about climate change and a bit about energy scarcity. So I'd like to start with a quotation from Alan Greenspan, who's a former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, who's rapidly becoming the villain of this little piece. Uh, this is from 2004. It's a quotation that he surely regrets. Uh, not only have individual financial institutions become less vulnerable to shocks from underlying risk factors because of all the financial innovations that we've been engaged in, such as creating structured investment vehicles and collateralized debt ob obligations and uh, credit default swaps, but also the financial system as a whole has become more resilient. Well, flash forward to this past September, at a time when the crisis wasn't anywhere near as bad as it is right now. This is Joe Nocera in the New York Times, one of the top financial commentators in the world. He says, nobody understands who's owes what, who owes what to whom or whether they have the ability to pay. Counterparties have become afraid to trade with each other. Sovereign wealth funds are no longer willing to supply badly needed capital because they no longer know what they are investing in. And this sentence, I think, is really crucial. The crisis continues because nobody knows what anything is worth. You simply cannot have a functioning market under such circumstances. And I think the contrast between these two quotations goes a long way to at least beginning to explain uh, what is happening in our world. And this is not just in the economic crisis, but also in these other challenges, such as climate and energy. That we're moving from a world of risk to a world of uncertainty. Now, this is actually a, an important distinction that economists have been making since the 1920s. Uh, it's a distinction that's somewhat contentious, but it's one that I think is very valuable. In a world of risk, you have enough information to actually be able to predict what the future might be like, what paths the economy might go along, and what the costs and benefits of going along each of those paths might be for you. You can actually lay out some probabilities. In a world of uncertainty, you don't have enough information to lay out any probabilities. You actually don't know what might happen. You're in a world, as Donald Rumsfeld famously called it, of unknown unknowns. Now, you may remember Donald Rumsfeld. He wasn't uh, my favorite Secretary of Defense in the United States. Um, but he did say one very smart thing in the course of his career. Uh, <laughs> He, he, at one point he was talking about the Iraqi theater and he said, you know, we have a situation and it was going really badly for the Americans at the time there uh, uh, in the occupation. And he was saying, we have a situation where, where we have known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And the media had a field day with this. They, they said, oh, you know, Don, he's certifiably left the planet at this point. Uh, but it actually was the case that he was saying something very smart. In fact, military people who deal with combat on the battlefield understand unknown unknowns so well that they, they shorten the term to unk unks. It's what Carl von Clausewitz, the famous theorist of war, called uh, the fog 
of the battlefield, the fog of war, or friction on the battlefield. These are situations where the situation around you is so complicated, the systems around you are so complicated that you actually don't even know what questions to ask. You are ignorant of your ignorance.